Okay, so real quick, I want to do a quick discussion on what is known as arrays. We have sort of used them before, but this time we're actually going to take a look at the inner working mechanics of them and what we can do with them. So let's go ahead and take a look at that real quick. Now, so this again, this is going to be basic arrays. The places that we've seen them used so far is in strings. Those are character arrays. I believe I've mentioned that before, but we can use arrays of any data type. So real quick, it's working. Yep. So, most variable types gone over are going to be singular items allocated in memory. So whenever we use an integer or a float, double, so on and so forth, it's just a single data type that is allocated in memory. The exception to that was strings because those are a collection of characters and it is what is known as an array. So arrays are contiguous list of items in memory that we can initialize with any basic data type. So with strings, they're just a bunch of characters in order in memory. If we want to make a bunch of integers in order, we can do that as well. And it's a really easy way to create some form of a list of data that you might need. So contiguous in this context just means that they are like, uh, let's see. In memory, let's see, they'd be kind of like this. I'm using these brackets for a reason. You'll see this pretty frequently. So, like 5, 15, 20, 300, something like that. So, in memory, they'd all be right in order of each other. So, your compiler is going to allocate wherever these need to be. You can choose to manually locate things, but generally you don't do that. For arrays, it will allocate it somewhere. And you can get those memory addresses, we'll touch on that later. But for this, it just says, okay, here is the start of my array. This integer, I think it's like four bytes, so this would be maybe memory address 200, this would be like 204, 208, 12, it would just be back to back to back until the array is done. So this would be an array of like four items or so. Kind of like what we have here. So initialize with a fixed size. So we determine the array size as we make them. They're not going to be dynamic in nature. They have a static number of elements in them. So once we allocate them, then you can start actually setting these values. So here we have the actual decoration. So array bracket five bracket to be a size of five elements. Now in memory, you're gonna have all these five different elements all back to back because it's contiguous, like previously mentioned. And for the individual indices of the array, they're gonna start at zero. So you notice we have zero through four here. So if I wanted to set the third element to say six, then it would be indice two. Or yeah. And if I want to set the first one you say eight, I set it to the zeroth element to eight. That's basically all arrays are. It's just a continuous list of items, and that's about it. Now there are more complex things that can be done, so it's going to take a look. So basic setup is going to be create a variable of some data type, and we add bracket some number close bracket to the end of it. That would be this line right here. So integer test array five, and I have equals brace zero brace. This just initializes every element in the array to zero by default. And this is just so I know what is set at those points in memory. Because if you don't, then you really have no way of knowing what is set, it might just be some garbage data. So this just has kind of a safety measure to say, yes, every single item in this integer array will be set to zero by default. So maybe if I address it or something else, my proxy addresses it and I don't mean to, it's not gonna throw a fit. It might react improperly, but it's not going to try to address some random garbage data. It'll be something that I know it's been set to. Now, to set the actual internal elements, just again, use that same notation of using brackets, but this time use the actual element number, so the indice in this case, and just again, recall that they all start at zero. So there'd be these three lines here. So I have test array zero equals eight, 
test rate 3 equals 5, test rate 4 equals 6. So if we look at the initial state of it, you see I have indices 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, all set to 0 when I did this earlier. So once I actually set them, then you'll notice that indice 0 is 8, 1 is still 0, 2 is still 0, and 3 is 5, 4 is 6. Because those are the three elements that I said, hey, I want this to be set to some actual data. And then you can just loop through them like so to print them out. So n i equals 0, starting at element 0, i is less than 5, i plus plus. And then I address it by doing test array i, which is going to count through every single element, 0 through 4, and then print them out. Not too big of a deal. Populating. Again, if you want to use that same notation of using a loop, you can very easily account every single element in the array. So here, we have a constant integer for the array size. So it's going to be array size 5, then I create it, all set to 0, like so. And then I have a loop here where I am setting the data for every single element. You see I'm doing i times 2, so in this case i is 0 for element 0, times 2 is going to be 0, element 1 is going to be 2, element 2 is going to be 4, element 3 is going to be 6, and element 4 is going to be 8. So it's just doubling whatever position I'm at. And then I have another one just to print it out. Not too bad. Now, one thing to note is whenever you're looping through things, you're not doing the actual array size. Remember, the array size here is 5. The last element is 4. So you want to stop at element 4 because we start counting at 0. So you want to do array size minus 1 if you're using the static actual number for the array size whenever you set it. If we want to get the number of elements, a lot of time if you're doing one dimensional arrays, then this would be the length of the array. We can utilize C's size of function to ascertain the total number of elements that are in the array. So in this case, I have an integer array and a float array of five. So it's going to be five zeros and then five zero point zeros. If you notice these lines here, I have int array size equals size of integer array divided by the size of int. Same down here, I have size of float array divided by size of float. So I am taking the size of the array and dividing it by the size of the data type. So I forget the exact sizes of integer and float, but the compiler will know whatever your... So integers is kind of complicated because if you compile on one architecture then the predetermined size of what an integer itself the data type is might be it might change from architecture to architecture but in this case if you're using this then it's just a safe way of doing it because you're doing size of integer and the compiler will say okay you want four bytes and maybe on a different system it's like okay this is two bytes so this one is kind of more static. If you did say like shorts and longs, those are generally more static. We, and that one has a different number. Same with floats and doubles. They'll have their own size as well. So that's why you see me do size of integer as opposed to say four bytes or maybe eight bytes. Or for characters like one byte. Just do size of the actual data type and that's gonna be the safest way of doing this. And I know to do size of integer here, because integer array was initialized as an array of integers. So I know that every single element in there is going to be an integer. So that's kind of how to you know, do this. Now, this is just gonna be looping through, printing every single element. This works by taking the size of the array in bytes. So let's say, let's say integer is gonna be four bytes here. Then I know I have five elements. So the entirety of it, since it's contiguous memory, that's going to be four bytes, four bytes, four bytes, another four bytes, and the final four bytes for every single five elements. So element one, element zero, one, two, three, and four. Add this up, I get 20 bytes in total. I just want to divide by the size of one element, like element zero, before all of a sudden I know that I have five elements in this array. And so if I did longs, maybe you're Let's do characters, actually. Characters, we know those are going to be one bytes. One byte each. 
No, I just have five by four. But that's not one. Five was five. And if I did something that was say short, two bikes, two times five is gonna be ten. By the size of a short two equals yep five. So it is consistent and it's repeatable, and it's a pretty good way to determine the size of an array. If say you're really really deep in your code and it was something that was initialized really early on and you don't want to use some static number that might be not very readable this is a pretty decent way of doing it and there's a nicer way of doing this in the next chapter that we'll get to or how to take advantage of this so moving on we have swapping the elements in array is a pretty useful task and it's not too bad but Essentially, we're going to need a temporary variable to hold a value, and then we just need to move some values around. So again, same five length array. We have element zero is going to be four, then zero, three, nine, one. You can see this is the array that we're working with. Swap elements one and four. So be this zero and this one should be swapped around. So I create a temporary integer for temp bar, since I'm dealing with integer data types. And I set that temporary data equal to whatever is at element one. So there's going to be zero. So temp equals zero. Right. And then test array one, which was that zero, I'm going to set to the data of element four, which is going to be one. So let's just change this to one. And then test array four is going to equal to my temporary variable, which if I know. From earlier is zero and this changes to zero that's another swap so that's the only use of this temporary variable is to store this initial value so that we can set it later so we try and do test array four and then do element one well we just changed that to one so we're gonna end up getting one again here we can actually swap it because we're gonna lose whatever test array one was to begin with. We store this zero in this temporary element so that we can use it whenever we overwrite element one. Again, just a temporary placeholder. That's about it. So generally, solving elements isn't too bad. It can be a little bit odd to think about at first if you're not used to them, but if you kind of just take the time to think about what's actually happening here, then it's generally not too bad. All right, two dimensional arrays. This is where arrays start getting kind of fun. And by that, there's a little bit of sarcasm there, but I generally think it's pretty interesting to map these out. So, since an array is simply a contiguous collection of similar data types in memory, it is possible to make arrays of arrays, and then potentially arrays of arrays of arrays, and you can have a completely, maybe eight dimensional array if you want to. The most we're gonna to go to right now is three. For now, we're just gonna deal with two. So that was pretty much the same, but conceptually they can be a little bit difficult to grasp. So I set them up in a specific way here to kind of make them a little bit easier to think about. So I have an integer array of test array three and four. So if we look at this, I have an array of three items. That is an array of four items. So I have three four item arrays. And that's exactly what I have here. I have 0394 is my first one of these. I have 7260 as my second one. And I have 8135 as my third one. And so we can see it kind of mapped out in an XY kind of coordinate plane here of element 00, 0 would be 0. If I want element 22 2 would be 3. 1, 3 would be 0. And then here you see I have some nested for loops. So I'm looping through the initial three array of arrays, which is this. So that means I'm here first, 0394. Actually, let's look at it here. I am currently here on this first array of arrays. And then I start my loop. Go in here, and now all of a sudden I'm here at element zero of this array. 
So I'm printing element zero zero is going to be zero. You can see that we are addressing it just like this, test ij, which in this case is zero zero, and the next one I would do would be zero one, which would be three. And then I do zero two, which would be nine. And then so on and so forth. Maybe if I want to do uh, two, two, one. Well, maybe two, one, giving me a one. So that's kind of the way to rationalize 2D arrays. It's kind of break them down this, break them down into this kind of block concept. Give you like an X, Y axis. Since again, it is a two dimensional array, but that's useful for these. When you start getting to multi-dimensional arrays, we're gonna have up to three dimensions and beyond, then you can think about it in a similar context, but it's gonna be a lot more difficult to grasp because we don't generally think in three dimensions. I mean, we can if you deal with X, Y, Z coordinate planes and whatnot, but once you start going beyond there, it gets even more convoluted. So I have a way that makes sense to me by dealing with kind of the depths of an array as you initialize them. So we have two arrays of three arrays of four elements. So this would be array depth zero, depth one, and depth two. So you look first between these two individual blocks. And then beyond there, you start looking at these individual lines. And then finally, you start looking at the actual elements within once you get to the deepest depth, which can be two in this case. So that's the way it makes sense to me. And then I kind of have it actually written out here that we have array zero and array one associated with this two. And then we have arrays zero, one, and two associated with this three. And then zero, one, two, and three associated with this four here. So if I wanted to get element, I don't know, one, one, three, I could see that I want this array one, line one, because again, remember this is zero, this is one, this is zero, one, two, three, and three would be eight. So again, eight here. This is looking at the initialization, the way I have it mapped out, one, one, three. It'd be easy to look at, All right, I have zero and one. Obviously I want this one. I have line zero, one, and two. Obviously I want this middle one. And I want three, this eight right here. And that would be one, one, three, and eight. So if I wanted to do something similar, I wanted to get zero, two, one, Zero, two, one. Then I do this, this, and this, giving me a one. So this is the way that I can think about 3D arrays as I start breaking them down into the actual depth that they're at. So if I were to do a four dimensional array, then it would be say just another one of these types of blocks. And I have to choose between whichever of those I wanted and then choose in this kind of nested data and so you're trying to go further down the depth of how much these are nested eventually choosing one of these individual items so again that's why i kind of think about it in terms of the actual depth because then you can see that i'm looking at depth zero here for this loop is choosing between the two element array which is these two blocks that you see or more so these two and the depth of one is choosing between one of the three lines here and then we want the final depth of two of four which is just again one of our actual elements that we might want that's kind of the way that i rationalize three arrays and it's not going to be very common that you see something like this i think i can only think of maybe one or two instances i genuinely needed a 3d array and a lot of that was dealing with strings because if you want an array of strings, you have to have 
a 2D array. And then if you want to make, say, like a dictionary or a map of strings, which would be something that you use in a higher level language, then you have to kind of have a 3D associative array. But that's like one of the only instances I've ever actually needed to deal with high level and like high depth dimensional arrays. But they are a thing that you can use and they do have some very, very useful use cases, but it is very circumstantial. Now, 2D arrays, those are very common actually. And then your one dimensional arrays are exceedingly common. But at the end of the day, that's just a bunch of data and memory all back to back, just contiguous data. So if they seem a little bit complicated at first, then dealing with say counting at zero, looking at the actual number of elements and trying to determine that, looping through them, those can be kind of difficult, but if you actually just break the data down and think about it, then generally they're not too bad. So that's all I've got for arrays. I do hope all that made sense and that you can see some actual use cases, especially when you start getting into strings over the next video actually, is dealing with the actual inner workings of how strings work because it is a little bit different than just a character array. They are character arrays, but we'll touch on their nuances in the next video. So, all being said, hope you learned something. I'll see you later.